You're giving me enabling, right? But as I got older, I started reading my favorite book, Job. Job's my favorite book at that time. I related to Job like crazy. I'm like, I'm, I'm like the modern day Job. Uh, and, and there's an interesting thing about Job if you've never read the book. And if you haven't read it, it's fascinating. Um, Satan is up in the heavenlies. And the angels are gathering around God. And God says, hey, what are you doing here? That always freaked me out. It's like, yeah, what are you doing there? I thought you, okay. So uh, this is the verse, though, that messes you up. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is uh, blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan didn't finger Job. God did. Satan didn't go before the Lord and say, hey, let me pick on Job. God said, hey, if you consider Job, why don't you go get him? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, that's not right. That's messed up. Why would God do that? Why would, I mean, poor Job is just minding his own business, <laughs> hanging out on earth, being righteous. And God says, hey, if you consider my guy Job. You know, Satan says that. That's, well, you yeah, know, Job, Job only does what you want him to because you give him stuff. You gave him a nice house and all sorts of cattle and all that. If you took all that stuff away from him, then, then it starts, right? God says, well, you can do anything you want to Job, but you can't, you can't hurt him, you can't kill him. And then the games start. And it's one of the most bizarre books of the Bible because you're like, did God really finger this guy and say Satan could mess with him? Is he doing that in your life? Uh, yeah. Hey, Satan goes, hey, I've seen Ladina. Wow, let's mess with her. Yeah, go ahead. Is that how it works? And then I figured it out. And I figured it out while sitting with Pastor Jerome from South Africa over pizza uh, at a pizza hut. We were talking, and he was having a hard time. Some things have gone hard in his life. And the Lord says to me, don't you hate that when Pastor said that? The Lord said to me, the Lord said to me, huh, I chose Job to be my champion. I put him in the ring. I put all the house money on him. I was so convinced he would be faithful because that's all he had to do that I bet everything on him. He's my guy. Sometimes you have to go in the ring, but he's my guy. All the house money's on him. And I told Jerome, I said, this is great because God's chosen you to be in the, in the fire, in the ring with Satan. And all you have to do is be faithful and it's going to hurt and it's going to be great because God trusts you so much to put all the house money on you. You're his champion. What are you going to do about it? And as I thought about that, I thought, how cool is that, that God would choose you to be his champion? Now, in the book of Job, all you have to do is be faithful. That, that's the only test. He didn't have to do anything else. He just had to stay faithful through it all. Didn't mean he didn't get mad. Was Job mad sometimes? Yeah, he was. <laughs> do you remember that part? He says, God, I'll have an audience with you. <laughs> I get scared of even saying those words. It's like, I'm not ready for that audience yet. He went through all the emotions we would go through when he was struggling. Yet, he remained faithful, didn't he? And what did God do with Job after he was faithful? Do you remember? So he lost his kids. He lost his cows. He lost his camels. Uh, his wife, she's a beaut. She says, uh, uh, why don't you just curse God and die? That, that's a help, mate. Uh, God restores him tenfold. You remember that part at the end? I love the part in, in chapters 40 through 42 where God says, oh, you want to have an audience with me? Let's do this. Did you make the mountains? Where were you when I made the oceans? Come on, let's talk. And Job's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that part. So this is one of the lessons I learned about why not me. got to hit this button again. I'm talking too much. God doesn't test us with evil tests us with obedience. What that kind of means is we go through things in life, right? Jesus said in this life you'll have trouble. We're, we're in a fallen place. You're going to go through stuff. But it's not a test of evil. God's not like going, ha, 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 let's see how you do this. He said, just be obedient. Just be faithful. I'm in charge. I'm sovereign. It's going to work out. Just be obedient. Just, just be faithful. And that's it, right? So I'm, uh, I'm writing this, this sermon. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I got to this slide and went, gosh, this is good. And then Satan says, okay, Tom, smarty pants, 
Why don't you tell Jack that? Why don't you tell Jack and his mom, why not me? And I just stopped. And I was like, I can't give the sermon. So I went to prayer and I said, God, what do I do with that? He's got a point. And, and Jesus said, Tom, go look at those pictures again. There's been these great pictures of Jack doing all sorts of fun stuff. Chris Evans, the guy that plays Captain America, did a video for him and talked to him. Captain America. He's been with ball players, Clay Matthews, even though he's a Packer, it's okay. Uh, he's been with baseball players, Buster Posey. He's, he's traveled, he's gone to Hawaii and done great, incredible things. And people, you know, things that he's wanted to do, he's just been blessed because people have, have loved on him. Is that Jack? You mad? And this is what, church. This is what uh, Jesus told me. He said, Tom, you got it wrong. Jack's blessing them, not the other way around. Jack's making a difference in these people's lives, not the other way around. And I thought about that for a minute and said, you know, honestly, I wouldn't even know who a Jack is. I would never have prayed for Jack and his mom under these circumstances, that these circumstances didn't exist. He would never get to have Jonathan shave his head. <laughs> he would never get to do this, but Buster Posey, Aaron Rodgers down there. Another Packer, what is it with the Packers? You've got all these football players, Clay Matthews there, right? In the far corner you can't see, but it's, it's, it's a, a Hawaiian group that got it. They're affecting, he's affecting them. He's showing them courage. Every picture I've seen, this guy's smiling. Dude's missing a pelvis or something. He's got tumors. He's in pain. And he's touching hearts. And Jesus says, Tom, you've missed the point. It's not about Jack. It's about what Jack's doing for other people. Think about the Fagan family and how engaged they've been. The tears that Tanya's cried. Jack's touched these people. And so I kept, continued writing, taking a big chance, because in the midst of tragedy, I would take Jack's place in a minute. I think sometimes we have to remember that our God does reign. And that sometimes what Satan means for evil, God means for good. And sometimes we think it's about us when it's not, it's about how you're affecting other people. And the light that this young man is shining. Jack's an incredible, incredible man. As he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That he was born blind, and that day someone had to sin to have a, uh, a tragic disability. Neither this man or his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Anybody in the room struggling spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally? None of you. Great. No. <laughs> I see little heads. Okay. This crowd's not a hand raising crowd, right? Not Pentecostals. It's all right. Have you ever thought that what you're going through is so that? The works of God might be displayed in you. In the midst of it, it's really hard to see that. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes the struggle you're going through absolutely is so God can show himself and glorify himself through you. So when I ask the question, why not me? I think of Isaiah. Remember, God says, who shall we send? And Isaiah says, how? Here I am, Lord. And I feel that way. I think, here I am. Ever since I was 13, 14, I heard that sermon. Here I am, Lord. Pick me. Whatever you want to do to me. If you can glorify yourself through whatever I'm going through, let's do that. So I think of Amy in the house. She had a heart transplant. I mean, think about that. She had her heart taken out and a new one put in. Lisa's gone up and seen her. I haven't seen her. She's smiling. She's singing. I mean, she's shining Christ's light, telling nurses about God. 
It's incredible. I think it's Sandra Dutton. Sandra's got cancer. She's broken a couple of vertebrae in her back recently. And uh, she's been in the emergency room a lot. And uh, everywhere she goes, she tells the people about Jesus, right? I see her two days after the emergency room, tootling on her little uh, walker downtown. Got a back brace on. That's incredible. What a testimony. And she'll tell you, well, how can she do it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For the glory of God, we do these things. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think that I'm going through something really, really hard, and there's no way God can bring anything good out of this. Now, I want you to think about your history. Have there been times in your life, in your past, past years, where you thought that, and you're like, you look now and go, God really did something nice out of that. I never thought that could happen. I, I certainly felt that way. I mean, I don't know how he takes a mom who was told to abort her son or her MS would get bad. She has her son and never walks again. Spends 20 years in a hospital bed. I don't know how you make good out of that. But the Lord said, I'm going to use that, Tom, to strengthen you so you get through your abuse so that you can do my will later in life. Because it's her strength that got me through the things I suffered. God's amazing that way. I sure didn't see that when I was a kid. In this world, you have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world, Jesus says. How many have trouble right now? I do. I got some trouble right now. <laughs> Is that what you call your kid, trouble? No. <laughs> she raised her hand, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. Stay focused on him. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're suffering right now, and some of us are, we have to keep our eye on the fact that Jesus is going to glorify that somehow. He's going to use this. You're suffering right now. I know it. You watch bad movies on Netflix. Step way too late. Drink too much pop. I know what's going on in your life. God's going to glorify it. God's going to glorify it. But all you have to do is be like Job. You're in the ring. And God says, just be faithful. Just, just do as I want you to do. And I'll get you through this. I will glorify myself through it. And it will be an amazing partnership. Understand that nothing you're going through changes your eternity. That's a hard one. Because right now, I had something happen in my life this last week, actually Friday, and I'm fired up about it. <laughs> and I'm trying to put it into perspective and realize, that's not that big a deal. God will handle it. And God keeps on telling me, trust me, I got it. And I'm like, but I want to have it. He's like, no, you don't get to have it. Nothing changes your attorney. Have, just, just relax. Ask God, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? What am I going through that I need to learn something? Because everything we do has a purpose, right? I hope it does, or there's no reason to do anything that we do. What do I need to learn through this hardship I'm going through? Trust that God's arm is not too short. If he brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. For his purpose and glory, not yours. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because, you know, when I, when I was uh, um, having stomach trouble about 21 years ago, I never thought they would take out half my stomach and some of me and replumb me and make me sick for the rest of my life. That was not the plan. But it was for God's good purpose. It wasn't my purpose. I wouldn't have done that. Matter of fact, have you ever read this book? Would it say the things it says if you wrote it? Would you change parts of it just because <laughs> there's parts I don't like? For our purpose, it's not for our purpose, it's for God's purpose. And we have to trust that his purpose is the right purpose, and that it's always for good and he always loves us, and we may not understand it. God uses all circumstances to glorify himself. We may not understand it, but we must embrace the idea. Don't overvalue your circumstances. This is so important. <laughs> Have a sober judgment like it says in uh, Romans 12. 
How many of you are, are emotional? Anybody? Okay. Sometimes we respond with emotion instead of logic. My wife would tell you I'd never do that, but... Uh, <laughs> she's like, ugh. <laughs> Sometimes we respond with all this emotion, then you find out that you're, you had the wrong information or it wasn't that big of a deal, or a week passes and you're like, that wasn't a big deal. And you spend all this energy on it. Because we didn't have a sober judgment and, and we just overvalued what was going on. And God says, look, <laughs> just do it my way. Relax. Jesus tells us we have to die to ourselves and pick up our cross daily. And when we do that, we die to the world, we, we die to our flesh, we, we pick up our cross, he honors that by glorifying himself through your circumstances. Now, let me just ask you this. How many of you had a bad circumstance where you saw God's hand? One, one, two. And we're going to have a seminar on this. This would be great. Look for it. Look for God's hand. Not just in your good circumstances. Look for God's hand in your bad circumstances. Think about who Jesus was. He was a man who had no place to lay his head. He was persecuted. He was mocked. His whole family didn't believe him. He understands you. He, understand, he was betrayed. He understands your circumstances. He's going to walk with you when it's bad. i got to turn because I can't read that. This is the conclusion. I'm not saying this because I'm in need or, I have, or I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well, better, hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I know that's a churchy platitude. It's like that's easier said than done, right? When you're really hurting and you're praying and you're not getting anything back and you, you just, you're just in so much pain. But I know this. It starts with trust. You have to trust that God is good. You have to trust that God's going to use your circumstances for his good purpose. You have to trust he's going to glorify you through this thing. You're going to have to trust that you are in the ring to be his champion, just like Job, and that all your job is is to be faithful. And he will reward you a hundredfold, Scripture says, in the midst of your trouble. So, let me end by saying this. Satan wants you not to know any of this stuff. He wants you to say, why me? He wants you to question the goodness of God. He wants you not to believe that God's going to glorify himself through your circumstances. He wants you so self-focused that you can't focus on Jesus. And I always bring up the story about when Peter got out of the boat and he's looking at Jesus, he's walking on water. Hey, this is pretty cool. What happened as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus? He sank. Help me, I'm drowning. And Jesus says, you have little faith. You take your eyes off Jesus and put them on yourself and your circumstances, you're going to drown. If you can see the glory of God in a boy like Jack, in someone like Amy or Sandra, or even your own circumstances, it will fundamentally change your life. If you can say, God, why not me? Here I am, Lord. I will be your champion. And I will defeat Satan through my faith. Gives you chills. Gives me chills. I'm ready to do it right now. I will suffer anything for the Lord so that he can be glorified. So I just want to talk a little bit today about changing your mindset. I don't know if any of you have ever been why me people. I was up until I saw that sermon. And ever since then, I've been, why not me? And I've had some hard circumstances. You know, I'm married. <laughs> I just pray that the Holy Spirit maybe talk to you today about why not me. Or maybe you know people that right now are struggling with why me. And you can share with them how God's going to glorify them in a why not me moment. And all about God's people said... Amen. Amen.
Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was